It's a pleasure to be here and uh, to have an audience with you. Um, I think I should start by saying that my life as a social activist parallels my life as an artist. And so probably the easiest thing to do is to try and um, give you the story of how I became an artist, um, since it's, it's what shaped me. And certainly uh, a large part of the artist I am um, draws on my being South African and being from South Africa in a time which some of you may be familiar with that was very difficult for people like me in South Africa. And what are people like me? People of color um, and people who don't uh, straight away fit into any of the, um, the compartments for racial uh, denominations in South Africa. I I'm of, of Indian extraction. Um, the, the two possible stories as to how my people got to South Africa, um, part of the first slaves that were brought to South Africa into Cape Town in, uh, say, about 400 years ago, in the 1600s, uh, were from the south of India, Tamil Nadu, where um, I guess my family um, hails from. I don't have any connections, any genealogical connections to India anymore, any, any, any family there or even, even uh, family friends or anything like that. So I have five centuries, uh, five uh, generations rather, of family in South Africa. Um, so already that's, um, as an artist, that's already uh, a strong point, a, a feeling of dislocation of being, identifying with something, uh, an identity like being Indian and, and also not having the roots, so to, so to speak, um, or, or any tangible roots to that place, which has all, all, its, uh, all the ideas and preconceptions about it in, in, in any case. Um, the other story is of the, in the 1800s, uh, the, the indentured laborers that were brought to South Africa to work on the cane plantations. So my family hails from those two places, the, the, the slaves of the 1600s and the indentured laborers of the 1800s, uh, also brought from the south of India. Um, so I grew up in a small town on the eastern coast of South Africa. If, uh, if you know, South Africa is the, the, lower, the, the lowest country on the tip of Africa, and it, it spans west to east, right? It's, um, uh, so I'm on the, I'm on the southeast coast of, of uh, South Africa, a place called East London, ironically enough. Um, and, uh, and then, as you know, our country was um, colonized by the British, first the Dutch, then the British, then they fought about it and uh, brought whoever they wanted into the country. And then many of us were just, were just there, um, f fighting for survival and what have you. Um, now I grew up in this, in this little town, uh, quite rural, but quite... Um, quite uh, vo volatile in terms of um, race relations and uh, especially since it was, it's considered the stronghold of the Tosa people, the people whose uh, spokespeople ended up being uh, names like Steve Biko and even Mandela is from the same region of the country. So we, we have a, a, a history in that region of um, uh, um, rebellion against the regime, um, the apartheid regime. I grew up in the in the 70s and 80s, and I was born in the 70s, and you know did part of my growing up in the early 70s and the 80s. Um, so that was the thick of of apartheid, and all, almost um, the the the, ti the, er the time of area the area of time just before things started to change. So you can imagine that things were at their, their height. Um, I would say that I was very lucky as a child. Um, along with uh, all, uh, what I'm explaining about apartheid and the heavy restrictions put on all, all people of, of color, of minority, of, uh, uh, you know, uh, I was also afforded 
great exposure by my family. Um, my grandmother in particular having um, been an, an amateur actor in her youth, she imbued this sense of concert in our growing up. Um, in my family, we, uh, we were often left with our grandparents or uncles and aunts and, and, that, and that kind of thing, you know, with the reality of having to work and all, all, those, all those great things that people have to do when they're bringing up um, loads of children. And, and wh what I can say about, about that, that, um, that sense of exposure, and it, 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 me, it meant a religious exposure. Having, uh, let me say before, uh, has anyone heard of the Group Areas Act? In, in South Africa, in the early 70s, yes. So, so in the early 70s, there was a a, a law that was passed that um, you know people had to be formally segregated, and I mean you've had a similar experience here in America, um, where we quite early on in South Africa, the government there sort of perfected the segregation into into laws. Um, so, I, so in, in the formative years, we grew up as black, um, whether, we, whether we had Indian extraction or, um, or um, whether we were mixed white and black or whether we were of purely African descent, we were all considered black and we were all um, allowed to live together. So I grew up in this environment of complete um, mixed upness, let's say. Um, you know, um, not not having, uh, not being forced into any one kind of identity within the the umbrella of being black. Then in the early 70s, we were we were forced to go to our own areas, and and pockets of land were allotted to us where we were forced to live. And we had to abandon our old um, properties, our old uh, domiciles, uh, communities, neighborhoods, um, to form new ones. But having grown up, or, or having started off in that environment, was, uh, was, a, was a privilege in a way, because um, because th that, that exposure, certainly in an artistic sense, meant a much wider experience of what it is to be black. What it means in terms of language, growing up with three different languages, for instance. So I, I speak Afrikaans, I speak Kosa, although my, my practice is it's terrible because I've, I've moved all over the place. I still understand it, although I grew up speaking it, and, and English. And as some of you may know, there are 11, 11 major languages in South Africa. So um, although everyone speaks English, all the regions have their different vernacular. Um, so being exposed to that was an advantage. Um, and as much as the language, it was also the culture and the, 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 um, the subconscious sort of acceptance that um, we're all the same. And there's, 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 much, there's much more that holds us together than separates us the way we're being forced to, to be separate. That, that luck continued when, when, we, when we were forced. My family, um, and especially my mother and, and her mother, sought out a, a multiracial school. So a school that went against all the rules of the of the, the, the country at the time. I was lucky enough to, to go to a school like that. It was run by Dominican nuns, um, German Dominican nuns. So they were very <laughs> strict in, 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 in some senses. Um, but it was, uh, you know, they, they, they had this, uh, this let, let's say, this powerful pull towards something that we didn't we didn't quite know as children what was going on. Yet these German nuns, I suppose they, they, they had an idea of what they were doing beyond 
any experience that we had, so many of us had never played with white children or even knew any white children when we arrived at the school. So it was a, a new kind of melting pot for us. And so I say I was lucky because that, uh, that added a whole new experience to what it meant to be South African, what it meant to be young, and, and a, a, a sort of incessant questioning of why things are the way they are when they, they don't seem, they don't, the, the, the rules that were forced upon us don't seem to really hold when we're making friends, when we're playing or or uh, you know, coming up with uh, artistic projects at, at school, uh, all those kinds of things. And we, I had one of the first schools where, um, and, and it's sad to say that that school doesn't exist anymore, which is too, uh, true of, of both my schools, elementary and high school. And I don't know what that means yet, but maybe we'll get to that. Um, but this school was certainly one of the first at that time that was encouraging the arts, encouraging students to interact around the arts. Um, and and I, I would have to claim that that was um, a, a huge eye-opener for me to, to even know that what we were doing at home with my grandmother and with family in terms of putting on concerts as kids, which I'm sure many of you have done in your, in your home spaces, you know, that this was actually a way, a, a way to create community at school at, with people that you, you, you hadn't grown up with, you, you maybe didn't even know at all, you were suddenly, or I was suddenly having the experience that we could, we could, uh, if maybe the word is engender community through through um, making art together. And I, I mean, uh, you know, small things like little playlets or, um, uh, you know, little music groups and things like that. So that was my primary school. And an interesting story about that school is it's also the place where I met Mother Teresa in 1988. Mother Teresa was a Dominican nun who came to our school um, as a guest and stayed at our convent and as a prefect, I, I don't know if you have that uh, designation here, a prefect at, at school is, um, I suppose, one, uh, you know, a, a student that's, that excels in, in some or other regard, sport or, or academically, um, or shows leadership, then they, they make you a prefect and you sort of, it's almost like um, I, I wanted to say policeman, but, but it's not that. It, you, you, you have some sort of um, intermediary power between teachers and, and the rest of the student body. So as a prefect, I, I was um, you know, assigned to accompany Mother Teresa from a plane to the convent and ride with her in the, in the, the car in the interim. Um, and why I bring up that story is I think it, it was, it, it sort of, um, it, it highlights what that school meant, that um, Mother Teresa was, uh, is, is, a, is a world, a world, was a world figure, is a world figure and an icon, and through the school and through the environment of the school, I was able to, to touch that. Or, or to come into contact with that. And that was a, my first, I, I guess, experience of really, uh, really being in the big world rather than in my little town or even in South Africa, but really contacting something that I, I felt ha had an international impact and even across time because she was already old and frail and she had already she already had this legend of being the great um, compassionate person that she was so so it was a, it was a it was a great turning point for me and then also to experience the kind of the kind of way that she um, she straddled different religions she, she was bigger than one religion um, and for me, that, 
that, um, that resonated with the way I was brought up, exposed to Islam, Judaism, um, uh, Hinduism, and Christianity. Here was a woman that sort of embodied all of that, embodied the interdisciplinary, interdenominational feeling that I had, uh, I had grown up with. Um, and, and, and was sort of schooled in, in that being more true than what was constantly drummed into us from, from the environment. And I'd have to say that this continued into, into high school, um, you know, ha having searched around the country for, for, for schools, um, coming out of one that was so unique and so different to the rest that it was on offer, it was, it was quite difficult. And, uh, Again, it was through scholarship and bursary and the vision of um, the generation before me, um, you know, to, to really have the, 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 the gumption to go and look for that school. Um, because as you can imagine, school is, uh, is, a, is a very, uh, it's, it's a very influential place um, when you're growing up and especially high school. Um, and then I was lucky enough to, to garner a scholarship to uh, a, a very progressive school. A school that at the time of its um, inception was being threatened by bombs, um, threatened by the security police, um, you know, to be shut down because they were open to everyone. Um, so this was, a, this was a, an accepted reality, you know, that to do certainly in my case, to do anything that uh, um, comes out of a, a passion or a burning to, to, to share or be in community, you, you, would, you would come up against heavy resistance. You would be, th the threat of being squashed was always there, of um, being cut off, um, uh, of being isolated. Um, and then in, in, I, I suppose I should, I should add um, that while I was growing up, um, you know, many of my, my uncles and family associates, um, and in particular my mother's brother, were sent to jail, you know, as students or as activists of any kind, whether it was writing material that was considered um, a questionable or... or um, uh, uh, seditious by the government, you know, you were imprisoned, um, tortured, more likely than not, and sometimes imprisoned for a long time. My uncle was imprisoned for two years um, he, while he was an undergrad. Um, you know, I was, I think I was maybe eight years old or something. Um, you know, and then uh, and that, was, that was very close to me, but, um, but also it was acceptable, it was accepted, I should say, because there were so many others, so many second cousins or, or friends of my uncle who had been in prison for a long time. There was Mandela who was, who was in prison, you know, throughout my entire childhood and high school career. So um, as, as much as these things had a, a major impact, they were also part of a, a weirdly accepted reality that simultaneously ha had very little bearing on what I was experiencing one-on-one um, -on -one with people in the interesting environments that I was being put into, like, the, like I said, like the elementary school that was multiracial and the high school that was progressive and trying to form something new in the country, which, I, as I said, again, doesn't exist anymore. Um, it was closed down, it, 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 it ran, it was open for about eight years. I graduated from there, but um, it became too difficult uh, and too much of a, a financial strain to be this progressive entity in a increasingly suppressive society. Because uh, right before uh, right before Mandela was released, you can imagine the things really came to a head: the violence in the cities. Um, assassinations of, uh, of um, uh, you know, the, 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 the a a a ANC, you're aware of the ANC, of ANC um, leaders. 
so 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 as much as we were in this progressive school we were also continuously aware of w the world we were in the small world we were in and and access to the big world um, seemed very um, very uh, ephemeral very very thin and um, not not really there um, and, and I would have to say again that this this time was very formative uh, in terms of building and accumulating experience that I'd later draw on as an artist and the support again which I noticed was was for the arts uh, and this this idea that the, the the arts for me at least was going to be um, a, a mode of expression and a way for me to to um, to interact in, a, in 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 the world and tell my story it became more and more apparent and and then after school I um, I went to Germany we had German friends that would you know, under cloak and dagger, come and stay with us. Um, th even through apartheid, they would, you know, they would spend a, a week or, or and be in our house, or you know, almost uh, without trying to cause too much um, fuss um, or, or or create, uh, you know, uh, without trying to draw too much attention. So we had these, we had this um, European, let's say. Um, resource and so when I when I graduated from high school I went to Germany for a year um, because there was no there was no there didn't seem to be a, um, a clear path for me with all this ex this uh, the, these like you know burgeoning feelings of wanting to be something else in a place where it wasn't really allowed but then having had the interactions and the input from all kinds of people, re uh, religious, artistic, um, new kinds of teachers. Um, there really didn't seem to be a place for me. And uh, again, I have to thank the, the foresight of my, my, my parents, or rather my, my mother, um, in, in suggesting or even um, helping me make possible this trip to, to Europe in, in 1994 which is where I voted from for the first time. My first vote, the, the, the first vote, was my first vote. I was 18 and I voted from Berlin in 1994, which was another um, <laughs> amazing experience because I, I, I connected to all these uh, former exiles who then made their lives in Germany and Sweden and all kinds of places, but were now voting from Berlin and they you know, they took me in as this this young 18-year-old um, to, to kind of uh, expose me to their life, uh, almost in, a, in, an, uh, in an apology for not being at home, it, which was which is an inter interesting sensation because um, these were the, in some sense, were considered he heroes. They were my heroes for having left and having made something of their lives that could uh, then be funneled back into South Africa. I mean, they still supported families and they, you know, all their bits of work were, you know, they, 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 they counted towards what eventually became our, our liberation. The work in, in London and, and in Berlin and all, and all over Europe and even in America. Um, so, so being caught up in that when I was 18 was also, um, I'd say a privileged, a privileged um, experience, and they they introduced me to great musicians like Hugh Masekela and Maria Makeba when they when they came out to Europe. So then I returned back to South Africa after after Germany, after Berlin for a year, and um, and now this this idea of art being the way for me had become quite strong. Um, and, and so I, I registered at, uh, at the University of the Witwatersrand, which is a famous university in Johannesburg, and started my study as, a, as an artist. And um, 
Well, I, I, I can say that it, those, those from 94 to 90, uh, about 98 or so, 97, 98, even at the tertiary level, the country was reinventing itself. You know, students were really interested in finding out what, what they mean in the country as, as, as new minds and creating new writing, uh, new poets, new artists. Um, th there weren't very many um, actors of Indian extraction on, on TV. Uh, black artists weren't on TV very much unless they were consigned to uh, like a, a purely black show in vernacular. Um, so the, the, the world of the arts was very restricted and then access to it was very restricted. So I, I, I had a almost overwhelming sense that it was going to be difficult, if not impossible, to be an actor. And somehow I still, I still continued. Um, and then I should say that Along this time, having, having grown up in a, in, in a family that was also um, troubled with domestic violence, and my father was an alcoholic, and uh, sometimes a very violent alcoholic, um, that simultaneous to this sort of blossoming um, racial or, or interpersonal awareness was this um, sense of of, of wanting to create justice in, between, uh, in, in the way women and men deal with each other, you know, some kind of gender equality, some kind of vo uh, articulation against violence against women and children. And that was a strong, a st uh, I, I, I don't know how to put it, but it was, a, it was a, an area that was always alive, f say from, I don't know, about eight years old as well, uh, r right into becoming a professional, which happened while I was still at, at university. I, I got picked up by an agent and, um, you know, uh, people were very Im impressed with uh, the fact that I, I looked different, the, the tone of my skin and then the, the what I was able to convey, I'd, I'd, I'd uh, excelled in, in, in certain plays that were not meant for me, if you, if you understand my meaning. Um, I, was cast, I, I was cast against type or, or, or race or look, and I often made that my, my cause, right? Um, and, and, and so that, that got me some kind of uh, notice, and uh, I started working while I was in second year. Uh, I managed to get some TV work, and, and in that, I, I should say, I was probably um, the first Indian on, on, on the TV screens that wasn't um, reading the news. In fact, there was only either one other Indian face on TV, and he was a newsreader. Um, so this was the, so, so I started to see that this was part of going to be part of my battle was, you know, how do you, so now you've trained and you have this experience and uh, perhaps this ability, but there's no, there's no platform, there's no parts being written, there's no, um, there's no way to get into the, into the, into the mix of things where you can, you know, be telling your story. So there was a constant battle of trying to, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, rebel against bad writing and um, stereotypical writing, uh, and then at the same time, the, the, this being on TV also afforded me some kind of platform to talk about um, about women abuse and uh, the need, you know, to address that in as a as a as a talkable subject. I mean, these things weren't really talked about until I was. Um, yeah, well into high school, it, and um, even beyond that, uh, and even still now, they're, they're, it's a it's a burning issue that needs some some better balm. Um, so, yeah, I th I think 
I think that's that's quite a quite a quite a trip to have uh, to have outlined. Um, what probably is more interesting is to hear what you think and how we can d discuss some things. Because I, I, I'm sure uh, I'll have more to say depending on what you want to know. I've, I've uh, so I've I've acted on 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 the South African TV screens for some time and been able to garner some sort of celebrity uh, but but it's for me the 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 idea that that's where the revolution needs to happen now and I don't mean on television but in the arts is is really been galvanized um because I I I've I've seen so much how especially in my case how the arts can liberate you, but also liberate the audience, even if it's just for the moment of the of the performance. Um, that sense of communion or community in in receiving a story uh, is is very powerful, and it's become the the foundation of my own my own study, my own academic study. Um, I did a master's a few years ago at. Columbia University and the University of Cape Town and the 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 core of my study is I, I guess it's the the um, potential in performance to change for change for creating change and so what it means in my in my professional life is how how to deploy the performing arts toward social change and uh, just give an example, the project that I have just left behind in South Africa is one to bring very much in the same vein as the Shakespeare in the Park here, to bring theatre to a public space at no cost to, to the audience um, and creating at the same time uh, an interface for professionals and emerging performers to work together and um, you, you know, solve solve many many problems around around access to the arts, around who the arts is performed to, um, and 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 around how the arts are performed. What what is the a consciousness or awareness behind putting a story on, behind telling a story, whether whether it's Othello or or closer, um, you know. Um, and developing that consciousness um, that, 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 is, that is an artist aware of his place at the time he's in, or, or she, um, you know, um, and, uh, and how, and how well, the kind of message they're, they're, they're divesting, you know, how they're, how they're what, what part are they playing in either the healing or the or the further rendering a part of of people's connections. Uh, so, you know, what I'll do is I'll play you a little piece <laughs> that I've written, um, and in as much as it's um, it's a piece of music that uh, comes from me, it also comes from from where I'm from. And it, it's also a piece that uh, marries a few musical traditions. There's a musical tradition called Maskande in South Africa, which maybe some of you have even heard. It's, um, it's sort of a Zulu folk music. And what I've done is um, I've drawn on that to create this piece called the Maskande Waltz. And um, yeah, I hope you recognize some of the sounds and I hope you enjoy it. To see if I'm in tune.
I've been living in Cape Town for the last 12 years. Um, I have a daughter there. She's, uh, she's 12 years old. And, um, but, I've, uh, but, I'm, but I'm here now. <laughs> and I'm in between um, either moving back to Johannesburg or uh, I'm not really sure. <laughs> I'm not really sure. Um, but I have a project there, as I mentioned, that I have to complete. Um, but yeah, I've lived in, in Cape Town, I've lived in Johannesburg, I've lived in East London and Durban, and those are the, the, the major cities in, in, in South Africa, um, with the exception of Port Elizabeth. But um, so, so, so yeah, I, I've lived all over the country and I've traveled the country up and down, you know, cross country, transverse, all, all in each, every which way, yeah. I just watched a, a documentary the other night called Naked Africa, produced in the 50s, and just the way, uh, the language about Africa, the language about, um, I guess, um, indigenous culture was so, um, well, yeah, it was so otherly, it was so separate, it was so so much filled with the idea of this is us and this is them that uh, you know it was it was an eye opener to see where we come from again and it's not very much time it's uh, uh well, what is it 40 years 50 years that, that that our ideas and our our ways of um talking about them have, have changed so much evolved hopefully toward something that, uh, I don't know, that completely neutralizes those kinds of feelings, of, uh, you know, but we'll see. We, we still have a way to go. One has to also talk about how South Africa is made up of more than just black and white. Uh, in fact, not very much white at all. Um, and, and yet the, the cultural presence is so strong and um, so dominant that it, uh, it's a slightly different balance than here. It was very rare to, s to start off with, and then how it was allowed was that it wasn't really to, to begin with. That it was almost in secret. We, our school was sort of nestled in amongst a, 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 a sugarcane plantation, and it was a new building, and it was almost built in secrecy, but, I should say that uh, because it was funded by um, people outside the country, so the money bought them some leeway to be to be secret and to be sort of un undisturbed a little bit. But once it once it came into existence, you know, it was for the first three years of my high school, it was we were under it was almost like being under attack all the time. I mean, I've I've never been to war or anything like that, but but I'd say that my my right until about being 16 we were in war we were at war we, i mean just in terms of the, the the explosions that were happening you know um it, it, very real explosions um that were ha happening in our neighborhood riots all, all, all these kinds of um things that happened right right uh, right up to 91 and even beyond 91 which is when we uh, when the ANC was unbanned and Mandela was released and, you know, if officially apartheid had ended. But, it, you know, it has, it, yeah, you know, it hasn't, it hasn't yet. And I, I mean, some of those same battles, particularly, as I've said, in the arts, in the place where I feel our salvation lies, that's where a lot of the, um, the hangover of apartheid is still quite, it's quite strong. How often is this discrimination? How often does it happen here? Oh, uh, in South Africa. But how often does it happen here? Is my counter question. Oh, oh, I see. I see what you're saying. Um, too often. I think my answer is the same. <laughs> so there, there's a daily experience of that. I mean, the poor people are still poor, and 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 many of them are are poor because of where they're from and and uh, you know the legacy of the past. And as much as those days are over and people have a right and a, and, a, and a will to, you know, change their circumstances. They don't, the, the, many of them, most of them, us, don't have the resources to do so. 
So we may be able to now live officially in an area that was formerly white and uh, you know, upper, upper middle class or whatever, but all the, getting all those things in place that you'd need to live there aren't afforded you when you're from the township, say, for living in an outlying area of Cape Town in a shack, um, you know, um, having gone to the school that you went to. Uh, so that's why, I, again, I, I, I emphasize that I'm, I'm a very lucky person, you know, uh, lucky, hardworking, whatever, but I was very privileged to have managed to dodge the real, I mean, I wouldn't even be here today or have had any kind of acting career at all had I not been as lucky as I was to just, just dodge the real heavy suppression, if that makes any sense. The lines are more blurred now, um, but more or less, um, yes. And, 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 and any new, new neighborhood, there's, there's, there's still the lingering stories of what the new neighborhood used to be or what that school might have, you know, was 20 years ago. The, the, the story still hangs in the air. The whole system was overhauled, like, uh, on paper. So, um, so yeah, when he, when he left office and Mandela came in, new principles of hiring and deployment were, were, were you know, employed. Like, uh, women were suddenly, we found we had women ministers and uh, we still do. But it's not to say that the, that, that the, the appropriate person was always deployed to the right place. You know, it was more, it's like, you know, you get, a, you get a, somebody who is a freedom, this is just an example, somebody who is a freedom fighter and uh, uh, used to, you know, um, physical skirmishes or, or, or you know, I, there's so many different instances of actually having to fight. Uh, that somebody brought up through that and trained to, to physically fight apartheid. When we when we changed when the, the you know power was changed over to the, to then becoming a, a minister or somebody high up making a, a politician that's still a transition that's happening that's not an easy one and 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 like I say many there have been many failures even with even a, in in the, the gender deployment of, of the wrong the wrong person being in the job. Um, because of where they were in the in the the hierarchy of the rebellion, so that's that that has to be mixed into the the gender deployment issue. But but um, you know the 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 liberty is there for and much more apparent that women are leaders, that women are in office. We, Cape Town has a woman mayor at the moment. I think infiltrate is a good word because that's what it certainly felt like. It felt like you, you're, you're in some, somebody else's environment with your own agenda that nobody really is interested in or, or they may pay lip service to, but they don't really want to see those changes happen. So it did feel like, okay, this is a system that I've got to bring down <laughs> or something, you know. Um, but what's the best way? I, I can't answer that. I can only say um, that as an artist, that you have to continuously interrogate w what it is you're, you're trying to do, or, you know, which part of you you're putting up um, and which part of you you're, 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 you're cutting off or covering up. And I, I'd say the more you're putting up, the more potential there is to create some kind of engagement and thereby change. And if the engagement is minimal, then the change is probably going to be minuscule. But that's me. <laughs> I may be wrong. Okay.